Hello, I'm Judy Bailey, and it's my very great pleasure to introduce you now to the Independence Middle East correspondent, Dr. Robert Fisk. Robert, thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. Um, you're based in Beirut, I know, but you're currently in Dublin. What are you doing there? Um, I'm sitting here writing at the moment page 1670 of the manuscript of my new book, which will be called Night of Power, and it's about the most recent years in the Middle East, especially the Syrian war. So that's what I'm actually doing um, as I, a few minutes ago before I came to speak to you, downstairs from here. So you're in the halls of academia, are you, in, in, uh, in Dublin, doing that? Well, I'm actually uh, in my own home here at the moment, but um, this is where I'm, uh, I'm writing my book at the moment, because um, uh, I'm still writing you know, two or three times a week for, for my paper about the Middle East, but there's an opportunity for me to actually finish this huge book of mine and then get back as soon as possible to Beirut. Now, it's an, it's an interesting role reversal for you, isn't it, to be the subject of somebody else's storytelling. Um, I wondered if you learned anything about yourself during the course of making this movie. Yeah, well, I have, I have been in other films, and they have made a film about my work um, uh, some uh, 25 years ago, uh, which was shown on Channel 4 and the Discovery Channel in the States. I didn't like making that very much. I quite like this one. My first reaction on seeing the film was that I thought I went on and on and on. I thought, my God, I can hardly stand to listen to any more Fisk. How can the viewer possibly stand it? You know, who hasn't even known me before. Um, I thought I was, I, I thought I came across extremely verbose and rather dull. And I suppose to some extent, you see, I'm repeating things I've many times thought about in the past and therefore to me, I was not repeating myself, but it was familiar territory. I have but to I say, I do disagree. I have to chip in here. <laughs> I realised when I saw the first uh, premiere at the Toronto Festival, and I was watching it, and the audience were obviously wrapped by it, and coming up afterwards, and you know, glad handing me and slapping me on the back, and they obviously saw it as being something very new. Um, and I was quite surprised that it was so warmly received, as it has been in many other places, including in Amsterdam. Um, I, I think there are several reasons for that. One is that um, the film was not a biography of me and it wasn't intended to be. It included quite a lot of archive material, even me as a little boy <laughs> with parents, uh, even you know pictures of my father in the First World War, not the Second, the First World War. Um, and also I think um, Yang Chang, the director, brought it together very skillfully and that he was trying very hard to, um, to make it a film that moved backwards and forwards in time, which is very much where I think my job is. I, I keep reminding myself that virtually every country I go to in the Middle East is the victim of the Treaty of Versailles, which followed my father's First World War. Um, and that, um, you know, because of the Second World War, uh, the existence of the State of Israel, which may or may probably would not have come about in 19... 48 if it hadn't been for the Jewish Holocaust in Europe and that in many ways I'm reporting and seeing things which are the direct result of the First and Second World Wars and because my father was very interested in history and I inherited his huge um, library of books on the First and Second World War you know I, I knew a lot about the First World War by the age of 10 I could have told you who got assassinated in Sarajevo in 1914 um, and I think that for that reason um, uh, the film sort of married up the way I think about my own work, and that way was interesting. The other thing was that uh, Derade was a great camera man and a great guy to work with. I, I found that after a while, you know, films aren't shot all sequentially. The crew goes away, and then some of them come back, then the director's away, and he comes back. And I found that when I was back working on my own in Syria or wherever, I actually quite miss them. I look forward to them coming back to join the adventure, you know, because journalism should be a sort of adventure, yeah. although it's a, you know, it's a pretty grim one, I suppose. Um, and I noticed that when Young first came to, um, to Beirut, first of all, he didn't wear a black shirt, which I was very pleased to see. I hate all directors in black shirts. Most directors what? I know. But... <laughs> 
and it's all right you're not a direct well it's, it's not a shirt um and the second thing was that unlike most western journalists who arrive in lebanon or egypt or wherever and start telling the people what is happening to them young just sat and listened to lebanese syrians talking to him and just absorbed what they said and took notes in a little notebook as i take notes in a real notebook with a pen you know, I don't clash away on laptops when I'm talking to people. I think it even feels rude to do that. And he, he thought about things. He didn't talk, he listened. And that slightly endeared his way of working to me because it's what I try to do. And certainly I use a notebook and a pen. And you see me, of course, in the film constantly holding my, you see me writing in my notebooks and you see the huge file and archives. Um, the, the files you see are actually here below me in the Did floor you? below. Did which you, you see in the film. Yeah. Did you set any parameters around the filming? Were there certain no-go areas? No. Um, I said that I would not talk about my private life because I never do. And um, private life is private, full stop. Um, apart from that, I think the only thing I said, and Young entirely accepted it, was that um, wherever we um, filmed, it was up to him whether he filmed it or not, whether it was terrifying, whether people were weeping or not, it was up to him, but that I wasn't going to redo scenes. I wouldn't drive around a corner again or restart an interview. Um, I noticed, I, I used to use the word faffing, which crews always faff, you know, they're always, oh, just a minute, Bob, it's the wrong lens, you know. Um, although sometimes I run out of ink, so I faff too, you know. Um, and just once or twice I'd say to, you know, young when he was faffing with some camera lens, come on, we've got to get going. And I used to say to him at the beginning, if you don't get it, I'm not going to do a second run for you. It's all got to be real. And it is real. And, and it shows because you can't, uh, although there are some scenes in it, like the guy who suddenly says, that's my signature, I sent the weapons to Saudi Arabia, which are glorious. I mean, it's what every journalist dreams. And there it was on film. Um, I couldn't believe it. You can actually see the look of... Uh, astonishment. I tracked this guy down in less than a day and I'd come with the documents from Aleppo in Syria and I found him in Bosnia. Um, except, um, and that was, you know, we had the camera running, thanks be to God, otherwise I wouldn't have rerun it. And I had this experience with a previous film I made called From Beirut to Bosnia, the one I was telling you about earlier, 25 years ago, where the director, the, the late Mike Duckfield, he, he died shortly after making the film The Road Accident, but he would always say, Bob, I don't think my 82-year-old grandmother will understand what you're talking about. Can you explain that a little bit more simply? And I began to feel very sorry for his 82-year-old grandmother, who I suspect probably would have understood it quite well. And it wasn't, you know, as we, that old cliche, dumbing down. It was just that he, he didn't want any tiny bit of the film to be inconclusive. So he'd constantly say, look, Bob, we're going to start filming in 15 minutes. Would you then drive around the corner? And then if by chance I drove around a corner behind a truck, he said, you don't have to go and do it again. We couldn't see you. Yeah, now you see, my, yeah. you see from, from, from my point of view, I couldn't really expect him to have 15 camera crews all filming Lord Fisk on the basis that at some point they'd get the right shot. So we had to do it that way. But we didn't do that. And, and I was very pleased about the fact that, um, you know, when we're in the car, we're in the car and we're going and that's it. And we don't know what's going to happen. Yeah, uh, we, has, has I don't know what's going to happen. Young yeah. has talked about the movie as being a kind of love letter to the sort of journalism that you represent. What do you I haven't heard him say that, but that's very interesting, isn't it? Uh, yeah. Um, I, the only reference I've made about letters is that I said, and I can't remember now if I say it in the film, but I try to write my reports like a letter to a friend, like saying, you won't believe what I've just seen today. And I think that Young and I caught the same feelings as we were making this film. I mean, it was his film, not mine. He made the decisions. Uh, but I think we, we caught the same feelings of, well, what's going to happen around the next corner? And we didn't know, of course. Yeah. Uh, none of us did. And uh, we didn't know how the Jewish settler uh, would respond to my questions about Palestine, quote unquote. Yeah. Uh, we didn't know at all what Amir Haas was going to say about the Israeli war, you know, longer and bigger and taller than the Berlin Wall. Although I had a pretty good idea what she thought of it, because uh, she's an old friend of mine. But um, go ahead, yeah. 
I, I, th I think he, he was really getting at, um, in fact, he has said that you're part of a lost generation of reporters. Oh, God, yeah. I've yeah, heard this sort is of like stuff. New reporting. You know, when I first went to the Middle East in 1976 as a correspondent, everyone wanted to interview me about the death of the foreign correspondent. There would be no more foreign correspondents. It was over. It was TV now. Right. Now, of course, we have the internet or blogs or websites. <clears throat> and in fact, there are more reporters in the Middle East now than I've ever seen before in my life. And I don't think there's anything particularly old fashioned. What may be a little bit dated about what I do is that I stay away from websites and blogs and Googles. I'm not interested. I want to go to the scene of a rally, a battle, a speech, a tragedy, I want to see it with my own eyes and talk to the people there and note it down in my notebook and have my pen with me and record it. And I've got all my notebooks on file and archived. But just a few minutes before we came on air, I was going back to the notebook I used to take notes for the story that I was quoting from on page 1,669. Um, so, you know, I, in that sense, I think that I'm still trying to be what I was when I did my PhD, which by the way, um, Irish neutrality in the Second World War. There's a connection for you. Uh, so it involved World War II. Um, and that was, you know, an academic who's looking for research papers and documents at a time when some of the people involved in the Second World War were still alive, you know, some of the decision makers. Um, and so I'm, I suppose I'm trying to do what I did in my PhD. Every day I go out for an adventure, which is exciting and sometimes very frightening or dangerous. But it's very nice to come back home again afterwards safely. Um, and it's got this, this edge of sort of, it is exciting, there is an excitement about being a foreign correspondent. Uh, Winston Churchill once wrote that there was nothing so exhilarating as to be shot at without effect. Um, of course, as a lot of my colleagues have been shot at with effect and are dead, as I always remind myself, you know, you've got to think you're going to report a war, you're not going there to die in it, that's not the purpose. You know? mm. um, I've said that to quite a few people. Um, but uh, I think that, um, yeah, I, I guess it is a bit out of date, but I think that I always say to people, you know, if you can write a story about Lebanon or Egypt and say you're in Damascus or somewhere in the Middle East, but if you can write that story from Iceland or from, um, I don't know, Nevada in the United States, what's the point of being in the Middle East? You can just suck in the agency quotes and a few cliches and put the word deadly or um, you know, or, or, or venomous or something. And, and, and you've written your story from, I don't know, Peru, if you want. And so I think if you're going to be in the region, if you're going to be there and live there, you must go out on the story and see it with your own eyes. Besides the fact that in the Middle East, hardly anyone will tell you anything on the telephone. You've chosen to live, <clears throat> excuse me, in the Middle East, mm -hmm. um, and in Beirut in particular, what is it about that area that you find so compelling? That area and its people? Yeah, compelling is another of those words I try to avoid, but I've just used it um, downstairs. Uh, I, I suppose it, it, what happened, you see, was that um, I was covering the aftermath of the Portuguese Revolution, 1975-76. And the Civil War had begun in Beirut, a city I knew because I'd been there on a holiday from Belfast, if you can believe it. and. Um, a correspondent there, I was working for the Times, the London Times, then. this is pre-Murdoch, pre-Rupert Murdoch, thank heavens. And um, our correspondent there had just got married and his wife did not want to start her marriage in the Civil War. So Louis Heron, the late but um, sadly uh, foreign editor, wrote me a note which I received on a beach in Portugal saying, I'm offering you the Middle East. And I felt a bit like, you know, a king being offered a state by Winston Churchill. And he said, um, it's, it, it's a great adventure with lots of sunshine. He was right about the sunshine. Um, and so I went to Beirut and suddenly I was in the middle of this horrific civil war. Um, looking back, it was one of the least dangerous wars I was to cover. If you compare it to Bosnia, Algeria, Syria now, it's much more dangerous. Every war I cover tends to be worse in terms of danger than the previous ones. Um, and I think that I suddenly found that um, Lebanon was small enough for you to write a good, strong report. 
every day and, and tell people what you thought was really happening, not what the agencies said. Tell people that you think someone is lying through their teeth, because that's what the reader wants to know, after all, or the viewer. Um, and I think that um, then, of course, I, you know, I was traveling out. I was going to the Iran-Iraq war, the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan, or intervention, as it was called at the time. And suddenly my world got bigger. And I did get the chance to cover Eastern Europe just before the fall of the Berlin War. And I turned it down. I went to Warsaw. I thought it was immensely cold, and I found a, that the Times office in Warsaw, where I'd worked from, still had a hole in the wall made by a Nazi tank shell in 1944. And I thought, this is enough. I'm going back to Beirut. And I sort of stayed on there. And of course, you start realizing you are covering history. And here I still am after 44 years. And, you know, I feel a bit like one is reading this great novel, War and Peace, Anna Karenina. And you're sitting up late at night and reading and you think, my God, it's gone midnight. Well, I'll just finish this chapter. Just one more chapter. Yeah. And before you know it, you see the, the dawn in between the curtains. You've read the whole night because you can't give it up. Because you want to know what happens next, Judy. And that is the answer to your question. I will never know eventually what happens, of course. But I want to know what's going to happen tomorrow. It's a compulsion, isn't it? Yeah, it is a compulsion. It's not addictive. I'm very happy sitting here looking across the Irish Sea in front of me, which you can't see, and the mountains of Wicklow, and then going and writing quietly and getting up and having my orange juice breakfast in the garden. It's not bad. That's also quite, quite uh, interlude for you. Yeah, it is. It, it, I was actually planning to take a couple of months off around now, and by chance, you know, I, I was actually giving a lecture in Istanbul and I had to come and give lectures in Ireland and suddenly COVID-19 arrived. And I thought, well, here I am getting on with the book. Yeah. Um, Robert, do you think that it's becoming increasingly difficult for people to determine what is true and what is not, given the amount of interference in the media. Here we go, fake news stories, yeah. But, um, uh, well, not so much, but, but the interference um, of big business, of um, PR machines. PR and, machines have been running since the First World War, when most yeah. soldiers didn't even go to the front line. So you, chatted to the generals in the chateaus safe from the shell fire. Um, <clears throat> No, I think what's much more, I mean, yes, look, big business, an armaments company owns the French newspaper, Le Figaro. So we know, don't we, that Le Figaro is not going to do a big investigation into the French arms industry, for example. Mm. Uh, but that's not the case with other news organizations. I mean, we have, um, uh, we have investors who are Saudi, from Saudi Arabia on the independent, but I write constantly with, I hope, devastating condemnation of the whole Saudi despotism, and it all gets printed and doesn't get changed. No, I think the danger comes from the technology of Facebook, WhatsApp, apps, emails, comments from blogs, which are extraordinarily abusive and dangerous. Um, I find that people start to believe stuff which, if you saw it written down on a piece of paper, you'd say is obviously garbage but they want to believe and because on a screen something looks sort of official and it's spelt properly and it's in columns and lines and has headlines on, it gives the impression that it has some um, veracity. I was going to say credibility, veracity is what I'm looking for. When in fact, if you live in the region, you know the story, or if it's about Ireland, which I know very well, um, I can spot immediately, it's just a load of old tosh and then bin it or forget about it. But very many people, especially people who prefer looking at blogs to reading books, for example, um, they are being misled constantly by what is in many, many occasions is actually turning out to be a, a, um, a sort of a brain of hatred within the internet. And I mean hatred. I'm talking about the, not just abuse, but people saying they want to cut your throat and, blow up your home and so on. Once we would have called these poison pen letters, usually written in green ink, and you could take them to inspect a plot, you know, your policeman who would say, oh, no, 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 I think you've been writing something horrible to Mr. Robert, and it would finish. But no, you can't do this here. And you find that even 
large news organizations like the BBC will comment openly on email or, or internet comments, which, which are obviously anonymous. They've got silly names like Jackhead or, or, or Rainbud or something. And they actually, they don't sort of say, well, is this a government? Is this, is this real? Did a real person send this? They simply accept it and that you're going into clickbait territory. And I find it, apart from being immensely tiresome and utterly boring, I think it's extremely misleading. And I certainly have found people shouting abuse at me in Beirut on the street because of something they've read in an Arabic version of an English abuse on the internet, um, which bears no relation to me, except it might have spelt my name correctly without an E. Um, but that's dangerous. And that is vile because I have enough problems in my life without that. And editors, editors too are, are sucked into this excitement of what they see on the screen. Yeah. Um, generally, I try to avoid Google because it's got so many mistakes. Um, even, you know, if you Google me, you'll find huge numbers of errors or age and jobs and where I worked. And so I don't even bother to try to pray. I just don't care. Right. How safe do you feel in the Middle East these days? Pretty safe. I mean, I, well, look, if you're, as I've been in the front line with the Syrian army, for example, and ISIS is firing shell over you and you see people being killed, you are in a very dangerous situation. Um, I always take the view, apart from the fact that I've gone there to report not to die, that to fear that shells are going to go for you and you only is a rather self-regarding experience. The chances are they won't hit you. But I was <coughs> sitting at an interview with a Syrian general um, called, he's nicknamed the Tiger. He's a very ferocious character. And shells were bursting round us on this field. Even his soldiers who were in steel helmets, you know, I wasn't even wearing a flat jacket, I tend not to do that, were getting nervous. <clears throat> and after a while I said, you know, General, I really think it's difficult to hear you with all this noise. Should we perhaps go into the trench now, you know? Um, so in that sense, you go through dangers. But if you mean personal dangers. Um, I've only ever once had an anonymous threat and that came from a Turkish lady on the telephone calling me from London in Beirut because I'd written in a story about an earthquake in Turkey that um, the uh, Turkish army know how to kill Kurds but they can't run a soup kitchen and she was so upset she rang me up and threatened my life on a telephone call from London, which I could have traced if I bothered, but you know. Otherwise, no, I'm, I'm in terms of sort of personal threats and warnings of that kind, I've been, um, great good fortune has smiled upon me, I haven't. I've got enough real dangers to face in ordinary life without adding that to it, yeah. Now, the hallmarks of your journalism really are an ability to, to reach inaccessible places and, and inaccessible people. Um, I wonder if you could just talk me through, for instance, how you managed to access Osama bin Laden, not once, but three times. Well, I'll tell you, it's, a, it's an interesting story now, particularly and tragically interesting, because um, Jamal Khashoggi, whom you know was most vilely murdered by the Saudis in their consulate in, in uh, Istanbul, he used to be a very close friend of mine. I mean, he then went off to Washington and we drifted apart, but we remained friends. I rang him a few weeks before he was killed. And Jamal Khashoggi knew Bin Laden and he and I were covering an Islamic conference in Khartoum, the capital of Sudan. And he knew that Bin Laden, whom he'd been with already in the war in Afghanistan, was in the desert. And he said, Robert, I want you to come and meet a friend of mine. And off we went across the Sudanese desert full of pyramids you've never seen on any tourist handbook. And we arrived at this little village and there was this man, his gold cloak, <clears throat> instructing his building contractors, remember he's a member of the Bin Laden construction family, to build a new road for these remote villagers to link them up to Port Sudan, um, which is on the coast, of course. And um, he'd never met a foreigner, before. well, he'd never met a foreign correspondent. He'd been on holiday to Sweden once, he told me. And he thought I was going to ask him all about terror, 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 you know, um, which I did, but only briefly. And I said, what I really want to know about is what it was like to find the Russians. And he started talking and talking and talking about fighting the Soviet army in Nangarhar province, which is in southeastern Afghanistan. And I know Nangarhar province very well. I met him there next time I went. 
uh, to Afghanistan. And he told me about, for example, how a shell, a mortar shell from the Russians landed at his feet, but did not explode. Many people will probably wish it did, but it didn't. And he said, I felt sakina, which in Arabic means a sort of calmness, a religious calmness, when that happened. And I thought that's a very important part of this man. He realized in a war that he wasn't actually worried about dying. Most soldiers do worry very much. I'm not saying he was a soldier, although at that stage he probably would count as one. Uh, mass murderer later. And um, uh, some years later, when he was deported from Afghanistan, I was still in touch with Jamal at that time. I got a call from a man in, <clears throat> a man in um, Switzerland, <clears throat> excuse me, who said, um, the man you met in Sudan wants to see you. He's now in Afghanistan. And I didn't rush off there because I didn't want Bin Laden to think he sort of click his fingers and Mr. Robert gets on the next airplane, you know. So I waited a few weeks and I wanted to see this guy to make sure he wasn't an Egyptian secret policeman luring me into a murder trap. Um, but I know later on when he was in hiding, he, um, he wanted to know about a story I'd written saying that Al Qaeda was the most sectarian organization in the world. And an American working for Al Qaeda in Yemen kept, um, uh, sending him messages, trying to explain the jokes I was making. Who was Robin Hood, for example? Uh, you know, who robbed from the rich to give to the poor, etc. And he obviously had difficulty with humour, but uh, I didn't, so I kept using it in my, my reports. But yeah, I saw him the third time, and the third time he said to me in his own words, um, you know, I pray that we, him and his fighters, would be able to turn America into a shadow of itself. And I was crossing the Atlantic in an aircraft, um, on 9-11, and as uh, soon as I heard from London on the plane that this had happened, I thought, that's been London, that's been London. I knew it immediately. Let's return um, to the Middle East and um, America. And I'm wondering <laughs> what you feel the Trump administration's impact has been there. Well, it's been uh, catastrophic, of course. It's caused thousands of deaths um, in Kurdistan, uh, in the West Bank, in Gaza. Look how many more than 1,000 people, 1,100 killed in the demonstrations against the US embassy moving from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. But it's also done something else. I think the, the Trump administration has shown that the Americans are the clowns that many Arabs thought they were. Now, I don't think they are. I think. America could be a very great cause for good in the world. It's not, but it could be. It might have been able to do that after World War I if it hadn't sunk into isolationism. But Trump has in effect neutered America's prestige in the Middle East to the extent that, for example, in Egypt once when, you know, um, uh, I was, uh, Sisi had just imprisoned another thousand people. And, um, I remember saying to a friend of mine in Lebanon, who was an Egyptian, well, but what's Trump going to say about that? He said, I don't care what Trump says. Anymore. I want to know what Putin's going to say. Yeah. Because Putin is the man who can be taken to Verdi at the Cairo Opera, as he was, by Sisi. Putin is the man who can sit as a friend with the supreme leader of Iran and welcome the most right-wing cabinet members to Moscow and call one of them, at least, a great Russian. Putin has got, can go to fly to any capital in the region and be received as a friend, even though he's an extremely clever, cunning fox. In fact, he's called a fox in Damascus by many Syrians. So is Lavrov, the foreign minister, who is rumored to write poetry. But that's what they tell me in Syria, but I've never seen any of his poetry. Uh, that's the kind of thing that people in the Middle East pick up. Oh, he's a poet, is he? Shire in Arabic, you know? And Putin interests them, he interests me actually. I would love to interview Putin. Um, but uh, I think Trump has, uh, well, you know, the problem with Trump is that everybody realizes that he is a crackpot. He's not us, he should be in a mental institution. And I said that from the very start. I remember an Irish interviewer saying, how can you say he's crazy, Robert? You don't have medical experience. Um, had I said he was sane, he wouldn't have asked me that question. Um, but they don't ask that question anymore, of course, because he is palpably a crackpot. And <clears throat> I think what it's done is many Arabs had felt, 
great resentment towards American power. And now they listen to Trump and Pompeo and all his, you know, swarthy crew uh, lying and lying and double lying. And they say, well, what did we tell you? Putin, compared to Trump, sounds like you know, a, a saint of honesty, although he's not, as we all know. Yes, but it's certainly opened the way for Russia, hasn't it? I think Putin might have got there anyway. Um, you know, there's this legend goes around that he, he lost Libya. And of course, he lost the ports of Benghazi and Tripoli. And he lost Gaddafi, which is technically true, but the Russians never greatly loved Gaddafi. He was always, a, he was always seen a bit like we see Trump now. In fact, Trump and Gaddafi would have a lot in common. They were both nutcases. Um, one dead, one still alive. Um, and I think that Putin has an idea of Russia um, in which he does see it as being, as he's his role as recreating the, the lands of the Tsar, if you like. I mean, look at these pompous golden doors and you know, saluting, um, you know, Cossacks and so on in Russia. Um, and I think that um, he has a very of course, a shrewd, he's an ex-KGB man. He was a serving KGB officer. He knows, for example, it was the East German regime which built the underground torture basements of the Syrian Ministry of Interior. And he, know, he would know that, you see, and he knows what implements there are there. Um, and so, you know, although you've got this sort of bright, rather dapper, cunning, fox-like man, he's also a very, very sinister man. He understands the sinister nature of these regimes. He has no uh, qualms about people like Assad, but he has a respect for people who don't give in. Remember when the Ukrainian president fell and ran away to Russia, Putin disposed of him. He wasn't interested in anyone. Mm. But Assad, hate him though we may, and brutal, cruel, and so on, did not run away from Damascus. We all said he would, even I thought he would. I thought he'd rush off to, the Soviet, to, to Russia and Mrs. Assad would be shopping in the Arbat in Moscow, but they didn't run away to, to Russia or anywhere else. They stayed. And that, I think, Putin decided this is a guy whom we can stick with and he won't run away unless he gets assassinated, of course. And that's why he saved him. And it was Russia that saved the Syrian regime, have no doubts. I was there with the Syrian army under fire when the Russians came in. I saw the difference it made. Um, <clears throat> Syrian soldiers liked fighting by that stage, but they were losing because they didn't have the manpower and they didn't have the weapons, and suddenly they got the weapons. And they would open plastic packages of new missile launchers to show me what the Russians had just sent them. Russia saved Syria, saved the regime in Syria. Can you turn um, to the movie now? <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, and the very interesting comment from a Zionist settler. Um, that the Arabs, Palestinians, yeah, yeah. yeah passe, um, and that the rest of the Arab world is not interested in them anymore. <coughs> Your comment. Well, he made a number of other comments which were completely wrong. He got fat and he had made mistakes with news reports he had read. He did make that extraordinary comment that, oh, the Palestinians are so 20th century, they're so passe. And I said nothing. I, thought, I don't believe he's saying this, but we've got it on film, you know. Um, <clears throat> I actually liked Haim. I've, I've kept in touch with him. He had a tragedy in his family later on. Um, and I sent my condolences. I quite liked him because he was absolutely upfront with what he thought. He wasn't I mean, he said things that weren't true. Maybe he believed them, maybe he didn't. But he wasn't a liar. He actually meant what he said, um, which is always something that I spot in people, even if I may not like anything they're saying. Um, and I thought he, he was a quite entertaining character in the nicest way of saying it. Um, and of course, he was, the, he was the balancer for Amir Haas, my old friend, the Israeli journalist on Haaretz, who's been a friend of mine for about 30 years now whom I greatly admire, although she's in my generation, so she's, how many years do we folk have left um, <clears throat> to go on reporting? But uh, she came across as the firebrand she is, the, you know, the daughter of uh, communists who survived the Holocaust. Um, and she is embittered at the, um, at the actions of her country and speaks out. I've encouraged her to go to international lectures and so on to talk. Yeah, I found um, Suleiman Khatib's um, story mm -hmm. really moving. 
find it, yourself emotionally wrapped up in these stories? Mm, Do you get angry? It was, very, it was very emotional for me the first time I did it when I was 25 years ago, and I was a much younger man, went to, um, and went to uh, Hatib's house, which was about to be taken from him. And um, one of the things that I found when they did the film, I didn't think um, it was really as comprehensible um, as, uh, as I hoped it would be. But I, viewers have told me, in fact, it is, um, it is very comprehensible, that story. Indeed. And I didn't realize until I saw it on film how moving that moment was. Um, towards the end of the film when he said he looks at the land where his home was and where I was with him when he had a home there mm. and I said what can we do and then suddenly the music comes in I didn't realize how important music could be to a film like that and it comes it was, in, it was a moment it was a very poignant and very sad many people um, watching the film and of course I tend to turn around and watch the audience quite a lot uh, were crying uh, but the most the, the point they most wept over was the young Palestinian girl who'd lost her father um, in the suburban Shatila camp. Mm. And that was remarkable because there again, I was actually investigating what happened to her father. And we were walking with the crew down this narrow squalid alleyway. And suddenly we met her out of the blue. I wasn't looking for her. And there was her father's martyr's picture on the wall. And there she was and she spoke English to the camera. And uh, a most remarkable sequence, that's when I said that, you know, suddenly a bright light, yes. light of all the lights her father could have lit, lit up with his electricity generator. Um, that's when I think it, that's a scene that moved a lot of people in Toronto. Yes, and it was a, a bit of poetry from you, Robert, if I may say. Um, it was actually, uh, that was part of the story I wrote about her. I was quoting from the story yes. and yeah. the only... The only scripted parts of the film were actually where I was reading from my own reports, which I'd filed to the Independent. And that is as they appeared, of course, in, in, in print uh, or on the screen. Now, you have um, been reporting from the Middle East for more than 40 years. You've seen endless Middle East peace accords come and go. Definitely go. Do you despair for this area? Or is there hope? Oh gosh, yeah, that's what's that's the sort of question that I always get asked by people who are not in the Middle East. Um, I, I think you know they value the ordinary things that we do, just as like like us, you know, looking after their family, education for their children, so on and so forth. And they have the same ethical questions in life that we ask ourselves, or we should ask ourselves. Um, and we tend to see the Middle East, I think, partly for sort of colonial historical reasons and partly because we we notice what's obviously wrong with it you know the poor standard of education in Egypt and in Syria to the appalling squalor of the Palestinian camps the enormous inequalities between the Egyptian um, slum dweller and the Saudi prince who can you know hire a hotel for a day's holiday in France and so on and have his own private jet and there is a sense of, especially among rich and monarchical Arabs, there's a great, I think, feeling of decadence that I don't know how you get rid of. And one of the problems in the Arab world is corruption. Now, of course, you could say that in America too, but um, corruption is certainly the, the great um, cancer of the Arab world. Um, and I think that... Um, we therefore tend to look at the corruption and the constant wars, battles which in many cases have been generated politically by us or by us sending weapons to the protagonists in these wars or sending, it, sending weapons to the sides we think we like who then sell the weapons to the side we don't like. And then we're surprised when ISIS drives American tanks up to a Syrian fort east of Aleppo, or I saw them on fire, you know. Um, uh, I think we in the West have a lot to do with this, but much of what I try to do is to connect the reader with the sources of this tragedy, um, whether it be the Balfour Declaration, whether it be the Sykes-Picot Agreement, both of the First World War, whether it be the Versailles Treaty that followed it, 
and gave the French effectively the mandate for Syria, Lebanon. Syria, they divided up and created Lebanon. It wasn't a state before the French got there. And of course, the British went to Palestine, the British went to Iraq, and, um, and America has sort of taken over these colonial roles from them. Um, you know, I worked out, oh, some 15, 20 years ago for a Sunday magazine of ours, which alas, no longer exists, that we had then per head of population, more Western soldiers in the Middle East than the Crusaders had in the 12th century. The question I kept asking was why? <laughs> you know, what are they there for? Mm -hmm. And the big question that I asked myself, which I think Muslims probably ask, but they don't tell us in many ways, is how can it be that in a countries where the people, most of whom are Muslim, still believe in God in a way that we Westerners, you know, we believe in Amnesty International and the Red Cross and the United Nations, but God throws the faith. But most of the people of the Middle East region, from you know Pakistan to the Mediterranean and North Africa, really do believe in God. Not that they always follow the precepts that they should, but nonetheless, they try to found their family around the ideas of religion. And how come that we, who abandoned God after, I don't know, the First World War, uh, Treaty of Vienna, the Second World War, I don't know. We, with our extraordinary presence, we come along and we culturally, financially, socially, militarily occupy these people. And we do so not successfully, but with an almighty bang. And we claim we win our wars. And it costs the lives of hundreds of thousands of people. How come that they, with their continuing belief in God, cannot stop our presence and oppression? That, I think, is one of the questions which I try to sort of draw it out of friends in Lebanon, for example, in Beirut or elsewhere, and I can never quite get them to deal directly with it. Why is it that those who believe in God are still dominated by those who in many cases do not? There's a question for you to answer, Julia, if you feel upset. <laughs> Robert Fisk, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you.